Spencer Matthews, how are you? Very well, thank you, Fern. Good. You've had one hell of a busy 12 months. You have welcomed a new baby into your family. Yeah. How's little Otto doing? He's fantastic. Um, different to the other two. Really smiley from a, mm. from a really young age and just kind of seems happy enough. His teeth came really late and, and they kind of just, four just came out at once and it, there was this kind of sense of relief. He was a bit uncomfortable around that. But no, he's uh, he's great. Like if all of them... Well, like, like he, he he's giving us that kind of hope for the fourth almost. Are you gonna go? Are you gonna go again? I think I think we I think we might. You know, you wow. can't you can't rule it out. Mm. But the, the, we're not we're not in a rush, uh, obviously, yeah. to, to to kind of do so. But um, but no, I think I think we I think we probably will. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Well, because you know, Otto's given us that. You know, if it was another, the, the other two were, were much harder. <laughs> so, and and you know, we for a while we had. Three kids under four. Yeah, that is full on, man. It is quite, yeah. Really full on. Maybe it's that thing of the third kid in a cliche way just has to crack on with life because there's two other kids there. Mm. And then the fourth's even more chilled out. Yeah, I was the third. Well, okay, dad's second marriage, so, you know, I was the third of three boys. Um, And yeah, big age difference and stuff and... The third's where it's at, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's what you want. Yeah. Let's just, that's that's the quote. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's it. We're done. <laughs> We're done. Um, but not only have you welcomed beautiful new life into the world, but you've also taken on this monumental mission of looking for your brother Michael's body on Mount Everest, which is a huge undertaking. And I think what struck me first when I heard that you were setting off on this mission is how willing you've been to turn towards that pain. Because I think many people, when they've suffered that level of loss, it would shudder at even the words Mount Everest, let alone going there, setting up camp there, and then taking on this mission. Did you feel a large level of discomfort moving towards the pain? It's something I hadn't done before. So because Michael died when I was 10, um, I never really processed the loss in a kind of normal way. Also, the circumstances surrounding his death were were quite strange. At the time, we were getting reports back from other climbers on the 1999 expedition that, you know, there were very serious problems with oxygen and that uh, their rotations were unusual and that people were exhausted in kind of, you know, meaningless ways. Uh, And therefore, he seemed at a kind of natural disadvantage from from the get-go, um, which was a shame. We were never able to prove um, any negligence. And, you know, that's not really what the film is about. No. But, but, you know, I kind of grew up uh, with the thought that Michael had been killed, not that Michael had had an accident. And I think the two are quite different. So, you know, I grew up with a fair amount of resentment and kind of hatred towards certain people, you know, certain individuals, um, which I think is is quite you know, understandable perhaps, but also quite unhealthy, Um, you know, had Michael fallen and died, um, I don't think it would have been um, as difficult to get over. You know, it would have been hard, of course, but it wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been anyone to blame but him. And of course, you wouldn't blame him for that. And, you know, the family understand and realise that Everest, claims lives and is obviously a dangerous place but when you throw all that into the mix as well you you can't help but but feel that it could have been avoided and I suppose um that made me um upset you know and angry I mean 10 an incredible it's an incredibly young age to to experience something like that with so much um I guess with such a lack of information known for you mm. to piece together this puzzle and to process it how did you grieve at the age of 10 um just by missing him I suppose and stuff but I didn't really grieve you know it was um part of making the film was um you know a, a kind of grieving process for me um I think I was protected from it quite a lot as a, as a kid and I would probably do the same for my kids. You know, it wasn't a prominent um, discussion point. You know, the, the the case against the climbing company was kept, you know, quite far away from me, obviously, because I, I was I was young. Um, so, 
you know, we had a memorial service for him. 500 people attended his memorial service, age 22. Um, you know, he was the youngest Brit at the time to, to reach the summit of Mount Everest um, and was kind of a remarkable person. Obviously, everybody, you know, loves their own siblings and has high opinions of their own family. But I just, um, you know, I couldn't have kind of loved and respected him more. And I, it's part of the reason why I'm quite grateful that I was the age that I was when he died was because I never I never really um it never hit me as hard as you know it could have done because I never really believed it you know when I was called up to my parents room and they said Michael's gone missing on the mountain and they were visibly crushed I didn't really understand why they were crushed I I just thought well let me know when you find him type thing it wasn't uh nobody survives the night on Everest you know it was like I I didn't know that you know to me Michael was this you know, unstoppable force of nature and there's no chance that his life could be taken from him. Uh, and so, you know, it was all quite a juvenile way of seeing things, but in many ways that protected me from, you know, the the pain that, that never came in, in as aggressive a way as it did for the rest of my family. Mm. But you obviously had an understanding that it, it impacted you and your whole family forever. You know, that, yeah. that changed things. And you say in this incredible documentary that, that you've it. made... Yes. Oh. oh my God. I mean, I I don't even know how to describe it. I, I watched it last night. I was transfixed. I barely blinked. I don't think I breathed for half of it. And it's, it's you've just done a beautiful job. It's it's incredible. Oh, incredible. You'd have, to, you'd have to give that credit to, to Tom Beard and, and the editors. Um but he he's the most phenomenal director and, and I, I loved spending time with him and the team um on Everest but thank you that that means it means an awful lot to me as I was just saying um to your producer that um this is the first time that any anything that I've made you know in television that that is it's it's really personal and meaningful to me obviously so I've never before felt the pressure of almost needing people to to not necessarily like it but just to connect with it in some way um, you know, it's two years in the making and um, it's uh, it's been, it has been amazing for, for, for me. It has really helped me um, process, you know, what happened to him and, 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 and move through it. And I don't mean to sound like I've been carrying around this, you know, grey storm cloud my whole life. It's not quite like that. There has been this hatred and resentment kind of within me, but... Um, it's nice to, you know, evolve and grow through that. I just feel like in, I'm in such a better place with it, having understood more about just him. You know, before making the film, I'd never seen him on camera before. I found this such an amazing part of the documentary because you reconnected or you connected with some of your brother's fellow climbers. You had unbelievable amounts of raw footage of your brother on this climb and really intimate moments of him in the tent, they were sort of mucking about and chatting, really informal moments, and you'd never seen him on video. Well, I imagine that, and this came up the other day, actually, because uh, I was I interviewed Dave Rodney for Big Fish, um, one of my podcasts. He was on the 1999 expedition, and he had all this footage, and it did occur to me that, you know, how come I've never seen this? And, yeah. uh, and, and you know, it kind of, I'd not seen it because it was shown to the family um, when I was a kid again, you know, and they had seen it 20 years ago and we'd kind of just moved through it. And, you know, I I never knew about it. Um, and Dave very kindly said to me the other day, he's like, you know, I, I, I had always hoped that there would come a time when you would call me or, you know, want to know more. Um, so I flew to Canada and, and, you know, I watched all this footage with him. And it's the first time I've heard Mike's voice since I was 10. You know, so it was kind of, um, you know, I tend to kind of smile and, you know, laugh, I guess, when I when I feel emotional. But the whole thing felt um, like amazing to me. And obviously the fact that he did record their climb made making the film possible, you know. And for those who are kind enough to watch the film, um, the 1999 expedition runs, you know, in tandem to our expedition you know, the whole way into the mountain and the whole way up the mountain. That is the most powerful thing to watch. Like, you are literally tracing 
his final footsteps. You swim in the same stream, you play on the same pool table, you go to the same temple and pray. I mean, I found it overwhelming to watch that. How was it for you knowing you were following that exact path? I loved it. And it gave me a real sense of who he was, you know, because obviously because of the age gap, we were never able to do things like that together. Um, but it gave me a real taste for what he loved. You know, it was amazing. You know, the the trek into base camp, if, uh, if you're into that kind of thing, you've got to do it. It's like it's the most beautiful thing. Um, and I really didn't expect it to be. I kind of thought it would be... The boring bit, you know, to, to get to the mountain. But mm. actually, like, when mm. we got to the mountain, you're there for four and a half weeks. I was at base camp. And that is a really long time to yeah. be at base camp. And so you kind of, you know, I wish the trek was longer almost because the trek was amazing. You know, you can't, I don't know how long we have or how relevant this is. But um, one of the most amazing parts of the trek was we, we came across this town called Namche Bazaar. And... Um, I, th I believe it's at about 15,000 feet. It's so quite high, you know. It's like you're you're up you're well, well into the clouds, so, you know, you look down on the clouds. Um, and you've been trekking all day, you've been trekking for kind of nine hours and taking it quite easy at this stage because you're pretty high. Um, and people are, you know, some people faint. And, you know, it's it's you're at altitude at this stage. You know, this is where you, you, you take it easy. Um, and you're around this corner and you come into this town and there's, kids like going to school and there's there's like a pool bar with and a pizzeria and cafes and a bakery and it's like where the hell is this you know like i'm like these people live there permanently and there's no roads so you can't drive to it you have wow. to walk to it it's you know it's 50 60 kilometers from the next nearest civilization type thing and you know we went out and had a pizza and played pool and like the crew were drinking beers and we were just having like a really fun time and it's kind of like we are literally in the middle of nowhere and it was kind of and then you had that sensation that you know Mike and Jamie had that exact same night you know and that's in the film and it's kind of it was just it was just cool you know i'm sure you know many people have have, have trekked to base camp and yeah i would i would really i would really advise it we did, we made we did our best to stay in the same tea rooms, the same hostels, the same everything that he he stayed in. We actually met a woman who uh, was in charge of this particular hostel back when he wow. uh, climbed, and um, she actually wouldn't appear on camera. She was really nervous, uh, which is a shame. But mm. but uh, but you know, she claims to even you know remember them, and we showed them photos, and she cried her eyes out. And you know, wow. I just the whole thing is um, it was just a really awesome time in in my life, and. Shame about the timing, obviously, with, with Otto. Um, I really missed my family and was in touch with them. Because he was, what, eight days old? I think so, yeah, yeah, eight days old about, about that. But, you know, we, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it or make the project, you know, without Vogue's, you know, kind of unwavering full yeah. support. She would have done the same thing. She thought the idea of Recovering Mike was a phenomenal one. Um, you know, she was... Uh, a huge supporter of this, which of course was, you know, I, th I joke in the film that had it been our first kid, obviously, I think we would have probably, <laughs> she would have probably taken you issue. You wouldn't have got away with that. No, don't no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think I think we've been parents now for nearly five years and we're, we're kind of in the swing <clears> of stuff. <throat> and <throat> those, you know, first, uh, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but those first, you know, month or so for, for, the, for the dad can be a bit of a, you know, like the, the child is far more attached to mum and, you know, uh, you feel a bit left out, actually. So the fact that the fact that the the fact that this uh, coincided with that, we had also pushed the project by a year already. We couldn't quite get the ducks in the row um, for the twenty twenty one season. Uh, Nims wasn't available, and 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 you know, we in the back of my mind, we had to do it with him. Um, and so we pushed it by a year, and obviously at that time we didn't know that Vogue would be pregnant at the time. Um, of the new departure, so... And this is all because, obviously, you have to have the right weather conditions to be able to climb Mount yeah. Everest. It, it, you know, they have to be impeccable conditions to even attempt yeah. doing what you guys did. And It's called cats, summit season. Summit season. Yeah, yeah. So you, and, can't, you can't climb Everest outside of summit season. Obviously, this is... This is uh, I, I've, I've been told to say one of the highest search and recovery missions in history, although it is thought to be the highest. Wow. So... The um, the search and recovery team had to go to the summit to search, you know, twice. Mm. So big mission. Yeah. So ha had to do it at the right time. Because from your understanding, your brother lost his life 
just after he'd summited on his descent back down. Yeah, uh, but somewhere between the South Summit and the balcony, yeah. we believed. And the catalyst for this search was a photo that was sent to you that felt like it could be a lead to some kind of hope that you could find Michael's body, bring him home for a, a proper farewell. Yeah. And this photo turned up, it was from 2017. And was that the first time you had the idea to go and go on this search mission? I didn't even realise search missions existed. Wow. Um, well, you know, searching's one thing. I, I didn't realise that a search and recovery from Everest yeah. was possible. Um, it wasn't, I don't think, in 1999. I think my dad explored that possibility. Um, but it is a relatively recent thing for helicopters to be able to fly to Camp 2. Um, and between base camp, where helicopters come in and out all the time, and Camp 2 is the Kumbu Icefall, um, the most dangerous part of the mountain. Um, it's a glacier, and if you imagine a kind of stream uh, or a waterfall that's kind of flowing down the mountain, that's what it is, but it's frozen. And so it is constantly moving, but you know it may only move by a meter every day, uh, but then it may not move for five, six days, and, and, it'll, and it'll suddenly just, just shift. Um, typically that happens during the day, so climbers you know, go through it at night when it's as cold as it can be, as frozen as it could be. Um, but people lose their lives in the Kumbu Icefall all the time and recovering a body through the icefall. Um, I don't want to say it's impossible because I like to think that people can achieve you know, anything they set their mind to, but it would be very difficult to carry a body through the icefall. It's, um, you're going across those rickety ladders and everything is um, can be quite steep and bits and bobs are falling all over you. you know, it would be to be carrying a 200 kilo, you know, what's essentially a block of ice uh, through there requires many men and I don't see how you're getting that over the ladder so you know you need to get to camp two and that's a recent thing so uh, although I think that body recoveries probably won't become common practice they are possible now and yeah this photo was um, the catalyst because it came with an offer to to look to, to recover him as well we received this photo and you know we all agreed that it looked like it could be Michael the guy had said you know, that the, he could recover this body for us, you know, for this much money in this amount of time. And it was all felt quite rushed. And obviously there's no guarantee of it being Michael, you know, so we went back and we said, well, you know, can you turn the body over and take a photo? You know, we can't, we can't see that it's him. Um, and the whole thing began to feel um, just a, a, a bit rushed and not, not, not so much our style, right? But it had planted the seed that, Christ, if that is Michael, then we can go and get him. You know, he is in plain sight. Um, and maybe that's something that I'll explore. And that's when I began to think about it and began to talk to the family about it. And, you know, so that was in 2017 and, um, weren't working on it constantly, but just, you know, began, began talking to people who, who knew and, you know, got, got the ball rolling. I mean, obviously grief never leaves you and anyone who's experienced it will have that feeling and it will vary in how it manifests and how you deal with it. But did you worry that revisiting this time would stir up old feelings for you and your family that that might not be so welcome or would be very distressing for you? Yeah, I hadn't considered even failure, like when we left. And it was only when the first search and recovery mission failed that I began to think... God, this could actually cause some harm to people in my family because we're all, you know, waiting and, you know, gathered around with Michael Prominent in our thoughts again. And I've offered up all this hope to my mum, as an example, you know, that we'll bring him home. Um, and that's kind of the first time that I began to think, you know, shit, we have to find him. You yeah. know, <laughs> because like, um, I, I'm a naturally very optimistic person in business, in life, and, you know, with this as well. And Nims is as well. So, you know, the early conversations were like, we'll find him, brother. You know, and I was like, great, well, let's go, you know. <laughs> so, so you know, so 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 that's that's exactly what we did. And we went out and, and, you know, with that in mind. But, you know, when that first mission failed, I thought, um, you know, that, that began to, to twist me up a little bit because then, you know, we, we know we've only got one, you know, one bullet left and, 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 you know, it better work type thing. The idea I say in the film, I think, of making my mum cry, you know, all over again was 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 not a welcome thought. No, and, and you'd also mentioned in the documentary that 
at the time, your family's coping mechanism had sort of collectively been, we've just got to get on with it. Mm. So was there a sense that you'd, I don't know, maybe as a family buried some of the feelings a bit and they hadn't resurfaced since that time? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we can, we as, you know, I, I can't speak for all families that have lost um, a loved one, but, you know, we keep him alive in our thoughts a fair amount. It's his, it's his birthday coming up um, on the 4th of March. Um, film comes out on the 3rd, which is a complete coincidence, wow. by the way. Yeah, yeah. So, so I like it when that happens. I know, yeah. I, I was mm. kind of surprised because they, they were moving the date around, the TX date around. It landed on the 3rd. Um, and... Yeah, his birthday is the following day on a Saturday. Um, our family always send each other, you know, big bunches of red roses um, on his on his birthday, and you know, we 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 have photos of him all over the house. I I kind of I'm not a very religious person, um, but like, but you know, I I believe in spirituality and and, and stuff, and I I find myself praying to him sometimes. If uh, not only when I need something, but you know, if like <laughs> if you're in like a really tricky yeah spot and you know i've done some of these uh you know i hopefully i'll be able to talk to you about this um foundation that we set up in his name the michael matthews foundation but in order to raise money for those you know both my brother and his wife and, and myself have kind of ran um and, and and competed in some some races you know um over the world and and some of them have been you know really difficult and i kind of find myself praying to to michael or talking to michael and uh and you kind of get that second win so i suppose he's uh He's always had a presence in my life. I went surfing once when I was a kid and I wasn't ready for it at all. And the waves were massive and I was really scared. Like I just, you know, I genuinely thought I was going to drown, die. Um, and I was kind of gripping my surfboard, kind of praying for talking to him to just get me back to the beach safely. I was showing off basically to a bunch of kids who knew how to surf and I went out, I'd never surfed before in my life. And like, <laughs> it was it was just horrific. I hated it so much. Um, and I was kind of saying, you know, Mike, please, please get me home. And, uh, and you know, all of a sudden it, was, it kind of felt to me like the waves just went away type thing and I was able to just swim in. Um, so, you know, just times like that, I've always felt that he's been with me and I like to think that his, you know, adventurous spirit will... Well, it certainly does live in me, but I hope it lives, you know, in my kids as well. And I think at the, you know, the end of the film, I, w I would love to see. A lot of people are saying that Mike, that Otto looks just like Mike, which mm. is which is lovely for me, and I love that. And you know, if elements of Mike can live in my kids, I'd be I'd be delighted. Mm. And how did that, whether you call it spiritual connection, whatever language you're comfortable with, feel? Being on the mountain, because as you say in the documentary, that's the closest you've been to him since you were a kid. Yeah. And that must have felt quite powerful. It was amazing. I, I you know, the, Everest is a kind of bittersweet place. You know, those that have been there and spent time there will tell you that, you know, most people that go there, I suppose, either go just to get to base camp and have a coffee and leave. Because it is, you know, you, you, you're, at, you're just, just shy of... Kilimanjaro's summit essentially that's the the heights that you're at so in order to be to sustain life and live there is just is a nuisance right you're knackered easily it's very uncomfortable um but it's also you know incredibly beautiful and it feels an interesting place to be and just knowing that he was a few hundred meters away from me at all times felt great to me but you know again I'm it was the nights that were hard you know it was just like the nights were bitterly cold, really uncomfortable. Um, it was just like a kind of running joke. It was just, it, it was, it was really like by the time, by the time um, the helicopter came, you know, at the very end, we had all, we were, we were, <laughs> we were ready to, yeah. to get out of there. But, but it was, um, it was just, it was just really interesting and obviously feeling close to it. I've never once taken, you know, five weeks of my life just to just, you know, dedicate it to him and just be thinking about him you know, wanting to find him, retracing his steps, you know, chatting to people about him all the time, being interviewed about him. You know, I've never done that before. So, um, you know, part of the reason for documenting the journey was that I just, I want people to connect to him in some way. I think what he did when he was 22 was completely remarkable. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was 22, um, you know, I wasn't climbing Everest. Um, and I think it's kind of amazing because it, it, it's a serious thing to do particularly back in 1999 
where you know kit was nothing like it is now oxygen evidently was temperamental um and uh you know weather windows were riskier you know you had less um adequate technology so you know it would say that it would be clear when it's not you know an hour later and i think you know well certainly what nims uses is pretty accurate i think you know although i'm sure it's wrong sometimes like most weather reports um but um you know i just what I, what i mean to say is you know these climbers would go out in the in the dead of night at kind of 3 3:30 in the morning uh, when the kumbu was frozen and we would document that for people particularly when the search crew were were going up and experienced climbers and people who've climbed you know other large mountains and have you know been around it for for many years were visibly frightened threatened by what's about to what they're about to go through and you could see real you know fear behind behind their eyes and discomfort you know before even going and I was speaking to Dave again his climbing partner from before and he just said Mike used to love the Kumbu Weissfall you know and it was kind of like I just find that interesting right and of course it doesn't bother everyone and not not everyone's frightened of it but even the puja ceremony, which is this kind of religious spiritual gathering before you go through the the um, icefall, is quite impactful. It's it's, it's pretty palpable, like mm. like the energy, and it's kind of like oh, God. Okay, we're this is this is serious, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, but he, even at his age, you know, just just was confident, cool, loved it type thing, and it just you know it made me smile a bit. You know, I've always had this image of this all being very threatening and very awful you know for for him but he actually loved it he loved you could see in the video it. footage of yeah. you know when his climbing mates are talking to him and he's just walked across one of those treacherous ladders that you've spoken about and he's so carefree and thumbs up and smiling and it must have felt like you were learning i guess to about sort of a different side of him that you you hadn't experienced as a little brother yeah I just learned a lot about him, yeah. you know, even just, just hearing him speak and watching him crack jokes in his tent at Camp 4 and stuff. You know, he he obviously, you know, the comfort is that he would not have known that he was only hours away from his death. But, but um, you know, he just seemed uh, like a really cool, solid guy that I would have loved to have grown up with and known better. There's a, a moment which relates to those final hours of his life that I know you have found very difficult, and that is the, the last photo taken of him. And he's reached the summit and he's on his way down. And this is a photo that you say in the documentary you hate. You can't look at this picture. What does it bring up when you look at it? Memories of how I was told that he died. So he looks incredibly uncomfortable. And he looks like he can't really breathe. And then I just have this memory of Dave Rodney saying, well, you know, they had Russian tanks in a US system or vice versa, whichever it is. Um, and that, you know, they were, you know, at base camp, they were shaving off like the top of the bottles to try and make the two fit. And it's kind of like, in my mind, I'm thinking, you killed him with that attitude of not having the correct kit, you know, and the, the you know, and, we weren't ever able to prove certain things that we heard, but, you know, we have on pretty good authority that, you know, it was just so badly managed and that there were very con serious concerns around oxygen. So I see him suffocating, you know, maybe that's not the case, but people who take pictures on the summit of Everest don't always look comfortable, but I feel like he would have been comfortable. Like he climbed Aconcagua and you know, very easily, far ahead of his guides, you know, in kind of record time. And everyone was giving him nicknames like the bull. And, you know, you could just easily charge forward and was just a very able climber, you know. So to see him in, in kind of miserable pain, clutching this prayer scarf, literally looking like he's praying for his life. And I never knew that it was a prayer scarf until I went to Everest. And so he's clinging on to this thing, presumably feeling like he's going to die. And it just makes me feel... Um, angry about the circumstance, right? A lot of people's photos on the summit of Everest are, you know, big thumbs up, smiling, we've done it. You know, it's supposed to be this incredible feeling of, you know, I've conquered the highest peak on earth. But for him, it looks like he's, you know, about to die. Um, And it's, 
I just find it a bit gut wrenching. You know, it's not. I, 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 for a long time thought it wasn't fair, and I need to be clear that we don't think it's not fair because Mike died. That's not the reason. I think it's not fair because his death could have easily been avoided. It's not the kind of thing where people go, yeah, but you know, seven people die every year on Everest. Yes, they do. Uh, but seven people aren't deprived of oxygen and seven people aren't, you know, blah, 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 whatever else may have been the case. So, I don't know. This is very harsh, what I'm about to say, but it's tr I grew up feeling that he had essentially been murdered, you know, and although that's just for the record, you know, not the case, nobody murdered Mike. That's how I felt as a teenager, you know, Um you know, obviously not on purpose. Manslaughter perhaps would be a better way of putting it. But, you know, that's, I felt like he was taken from us by people who did a shit job. How have you shouldered that injustice and that anger? Um, I've never made the correlation between the alcoholism and that um, until just very recently. I had a kind of... I had a therapy session before heading out to the mountain because... Um, I don't really know why. I just, I just thought it was kind of something that I should perhaps kind of explore because everyone kept saying, like, how are you, how are you going to handle it when you get there? And, you know, don't you realise you're going to have to ID him? Like, you're going to have to s physically see his, you know, dead body, you know, frozen on the mountain. And I thought, you know, God, wouldn't it be nice to talk to somebody who's kind of done this before? But that's that's nobody, obviously. There's nobody that's had that experience before. So... I took uh, the advice of a good friend of mine and he just said, you know, why don't you go and just have a session with, with somebody and just talk about it, you know, and just see see what comes up. And he was kind of uh, massively of the opinion. And I, I recently was interviewed by um, the Sunday Times magazine and they, they said the, the same thing. They were like, you're quite, um, they were like, I'm asking you quite um, like emotionally charged, like poignant questions and you're quite hardened by the whole thing. I would say together. I would never say hardened because I think yeah. you're really articulate in how you describe your feelings. But I think even through the documentary, you can see you hold it together. This guy that I saw said that he believes from, we spoke for three and a half hours uh, and he believes that I've been suppressing emotion my, my whole life, you know, because of, um, because of this loss. And, you know, whether he's right or wrong, it kind of just got me thinking and, you know, the, the Matthews, um, I think it was described recently as a Matthews, like, family badge of honour is to not show any weakness. It's like, I'm not, not sure it's a kind of family badge of honour, but it certainly certainly is the case that when we were younger, like, showing any kind of weakness um, felt wrong. There was no sympathy, really, for that kind of behaviour. Not around the loss, per se. I'm talking about, like, if you fell off a ladder and hurt yourself type thing, you know, any kind of crying, whinging, you know, would be perceived to be like, you know, hope you didn't dent the floor type thing, you know, get on with it. Mm. Um, you know, and it was just a very, felt a very normal way to be brought up, you know, and, and we we were a very kind of, you know, crack, get on get on with it and crack on and if you hurt yourself, what's, what, crying's not going to fix it, you know, type thing. Um, and so, I don't know, just I, I've, I've kind of lacked any kind of sympathy for others <laughs> my my whole life <laughs> and you know it has been funny at times you know my, my my close friends find it amusing right that I have little empathy and 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 you know and, and we you know I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing either it's quite useful in business it's quite useful in certain things but I think it's perhaps not so useful with your kids you know I think instilling in my kids that crying is weak is probably something that I won't do um because I don't agree with it but that's not to say that I would change the way I was brought up. I'm quite happy with the way that I am, if I'm honest. Uh, I just think that, you know, I think that I do have a kind of hardened view of of certain things. Um, and I guess it's probably related. And as for the alcoholism and, and the kind of abusing alcohol um, for most of my adult life, I've never felt comfortable um, having a reason behind that you know I've never really gone to therapy about that either there was a few sessions and a few AA meetings and stuff like that but nothing nothing major like no continued support in that regard and of course the first thing that they say is well you know of course it's completely to do with you know Michael's death and I always found that really irritating 
Why is that? I don't really know. I don't know. I don't want to blame... Not that it's him being blamed for anything, but I don't want to blame my good times, in inverted commas, or alcoholism or, or issues in my life with what happened to me as a kid. I've always been... Um, I've never wanted to see it as a trauma, although although it obviously is. I'm only kind of coming to grips with a lot of this now. These are all kind of fresh feelings for me. Do you think that's because you're sober? Possibly, yeah. I don't think any of this would have been doable if I wasn't sober. So, it's, it's very interesting because my husband's been through a very similar experience of alcoholism. Um, now he's been clean for 10 years. Having the clarity to piece together his mum's very sudden death, how that impacted him, his past and history. And maybe there is this sense that you're sort of pickling yourself when you are drinking and you, yeah. you halt any... Pickling, I like. Yeah, you kind of halt any curiosity, I guess, or um, a willingness to dig around and look into it. Because it's painful. You don't want to do it, of course. Yeah, I think the two probably are related. Um, um, but I don't know. I've I've always been against that word trauma in my case. I've just not been comfortable with that. I don't know why. I don't want any sympathy from anyone. I don't want any I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. But what if it allowed you to honor what you've been through so you can I don't think anyone can ever properly heal from anything, but you can work towards that. I think I'd be very open to that. I I I, I would love to be a more kind of emotional person, I suppose. Um but yeah, maybe I'll go and see, maybe I'll go and see this guy again. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I I it doesn't scare me. It doesn't scare me. I think I think being in touch with your feelings and and having a softer persona as a man is 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 a great thing. Um not all the time, mind you. Like I think I think that I think that you know, I don't really know what I think. I think I think I think I think it would be interesting to explore and I think it's probably worth it. I think with things like alcoholism uh Trying to get to the bottom of it is probably more complicated for me than just stopping drinking. And if you stop drinking, then the problem is solved, like as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I don't know. People say to me all the time, well, how did you just stop drinking? And, you know, the answer is one day I just I decided that I was going to stop drinking. Right. And and. I decided that I had a really detrimental relationship with alcohol um, that was damaging to my physical health. Not so much my mental health, I don't think, at the time, but just physical health. Um, and I wanted my wife to be proud of me again, right? Or proud of me for the first time, I suppose. You know, she is an amazing woman. I love her. And there were times, because she hardly drinks, that my constant drinking was really apparent when we started to live together and spend more time together and we'd watch a film and I'd have a, a whiskey on the rocks and she'd be like are you going out later or you know and I, I'd just be like no just watching a film just a casual whiskey on the yeah rocks. yeah no and she and, and then you know I'd have another one and she's like she'd just be like is it normal to be drinking kind of whiskey at home when we're just watching a film and I'd just be like I thought she was the weirdo <laughs> I, I, I literally was just like, yeah, like everybody drinks like, you know, a fair amount. And she was <laughs> just like, she, she was like, I'm not sure that everybody drinks like like you drink. And I was like, OK. Uh, and it took a while. And obviously it kind of got, you know, there were times when it was quite bad and there were other times when it wasn't so bad. But, you know, I decided that um, to give myself the best chance of, of being, um, you know, the person that I'd always hoped that I could become or, or, you know, fulfilling, you know, any kind of full potential. I'd give myself, you know. Go, I, I'd give myself a real opportunity by by stopping drinking, and I, I just loved it. Like I, I, you know, you watch all these Denzel Washington stories and Bradley Cooper stories and stuff, and it kind of like what they're saying is true. Like it's kind of it is a beautiful thing to be sober, and it 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 you know, I don't think anybody misses being drunk. Like no. I think I think that that kind of drink, or, or maybe two drinks, at a special thing that gives you that slight buzz and confidence boost like maybe from time to time you might think like oh, that'd be quite fun to have a little margarita or whatever but but ultimately if you sum up the two ways of life they're not even comparable like one is awesome and one sucks yeah and it's kind of like you know you just pick a lane in my case I and mean, i think it's different for everybody how 
you deal with that kind of issue. My husband, strangely, had a very similar moment of clarity and the conclusion was, I'm going to stop today. And he has managed to, and I know it's very much a daily thought and a practice, but, you know, I'm certainly very proud of him. But I think he... We've talked a lot about the grief that he's felt since having that clarity because he was numbing layers of it or some of the feelings around it. Or he's certainly experiencing things for the first time with very fresh, open eyes. Have you approached grief with any clarity or any, I don't know, layers peeled back that you weren't feeling before? Um, Making the film felt like a grieving process for me. Um, and, and I kind of became more emotional than I ever have been before on the mountain, not all of it on camera. Um, but kind of, you know, it felt for me like I, like I was really coming to grips with um, the loss, but it is something I would love to explore more. Um, I know my wife would think that was a good idea. Mm. Um, but I kind of don't want to lose, you know, who I am either. I think not you can that, do not, both. Yeah, I'm sure you probably can do both, can't you? I think you can. Yeah. But I think what you have experienced on this trip is just huge. I, I can't imagine you could get much closer to that grief, being in the setting, walking the same footsteps as your brother, knowing you're in close proximity. I think, you, you know, you're facing it head on already. I don't think you could get any closer to to those feelings so you're you're clearly willing to to explore grief and and how it's impacted you and your family and to dig into that I think you know you're already doing it clearly I think it's such a universal feeling as well as part of the reason that I think um the film can be impactful for for people because you know you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that hasn't lost someone yeah you know in their life and I think any mother or sibling uh, or parent or, you know, will, will will understand the journey. And, yeah, I just, I look, I hope people love it. You know, we, we for the last 20 or so years, we, we set up, um, you know, a small foundation in his name. And when I was going through the, well, shall we document it or shall we not document it phase, um the foundation was pretty prominent in in my thoughts. You know, kind of we've been doing these, you know, the Marathon de Sable and the Ice Ultra and bits and bobs to raise, you know, tens of thousands here and there. You know, over time, it's quite a lot of money and we've been able to build, you know, five schools in remote, um, you know, rural parts of uh, Tanzania. And, and we, we're, we've, we're helping uh, or have helped 7,620 kids. And that's, that's great. That's but incredible. It's cool. And it, it is. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's great. But my, the way I'm geared is I just want to do, I just want to do more. I know Mike would want us to do more. I just, I just kind of, if we can turbocharge that foundation by shining a light on, on Mike so that when we're doing these events, People go, I remember that kid from that film. Actually, you know, what this foundation is doing is is interesting and great. You know, I think, you know, I'll, I'll give three quid, five quid, whatever it might be. I think that could really help us do more in his name. And I think that's, I always want more, by the way, like, like with anything, like, you know, 10x, whatever you're looking at, you know, that's kind of where I want to be. Um, but particularly in the case of helping kids. And actually, it would be awesome to do something here as well or you know just 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 have that ability to help more kids would be phenomenal mm. and i think we kind of hit we've hit a bit of a what do we do next yeah you know and and, and that was quite a big part for me of you know it makes sense to make this film in the hope that people watch it people understand who he was and people um you know, want to be involved in, in in helping people. Well, they will. And it's it, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing with the foundation. And it's interesting because you just said there, I hope people watch the film and see this kid. Because obviously Mike was 22. He was very young. And you've had this strange um, moment, I guess, of understanding and processing that you're much older than 
the age of 22 now, but you still obviously see him as your big brother. I yeah. mean, that's such a strange thing to work out, you know, how how you see him as a big brother, but he was only 22 when he died. Yeah. At the time of making the film, I was about 12 years older than him. And at the time of his death, he was 12 years older than me. So it was kind of like yeah. perfectly, perfectly kind of... Um, parallel if that's correct which is probably not uh and kind of it felt there was quite a few parts in the film that that were mirrored in in that regard and you know i I said the other day that you know i'm his big brother now right it feels like i'm kind of going out to find him and bring him home as you know my little brother but i'll always see him as my big brother because that's Mm. how i remember him so you already mentioned that the first attempt to recover Mike's body was not successful. And that was a lot to take on. And you were at the time, you know, trying to work out, okay, well, what's the plan B? They went, your your brilliant team of climbers went on a second mission to look for Mike's body. And sadly, they did not find him again. So that was crushing to you. But alongside this, I guess, realisation that you might come home without Mike, you had another idea. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we had to take, you know, data is the wrong word, but we had, we, had to, we, had, we had to take learnings from the first search. And there was plenty of snow on the mountain. And we always knew that the second search would have less snow because it's later in the season, slightly warmer. So, you know, if we felt that there was a lot of snow in the first search and that Michael was perhaps, you know, could have been in sight, but was just buried by snow, we're never going to see him. Um, and that's the kind of, that's what I was clutching onto for hope. But then you're like lying in base camp thinking, well, I need, you know, I literally need the snow to come off the mountain for us to have a successful second search. And, you know, every so often you'd wake up in the middle of the night and it would be snowing, you know, and it's like, it was just really kind of gut-wrenching. There was there was nine days, I think, between the two searches. And in that time, obviously, at base camp, I had plenty of uh, moments of doubt, you know, where I thought to myself, if we don't find him on the second search and we go home empty-handed, uh, that will be a tremendous waste of... Um, not time, because as I've already said, you know, I had this incredible journey on the mountain, but, but you know, resource perhaps. It would be, a you know, the, the fact that these guys have gone up there twice, you know, all the way up to the summit to, for us to, to, to do nothing and, and not bring him home would have been unfortunate. Um, so we just began to think, you know, there is a, there's a record of... Um, bodies and where where they're supposed to be on the mountain you know more recent bodies obviously are more likely to be um at their final resting place bodies move on everest high winds um the surface can become icy and slippery um uh, so if that happens and the body is loose the wind comes blows it off uh bodies can be blown down into nepal uh or tibet um and in any case, that's, you know, very unlikely to find them once they're completely off um, track. Um, they can also be kind of swallowed up by the mountain, so they can be covered in snow. That snow then turns to ice. That then becomes a new kind of layer on the mountain, and, and they're, you know, lost in the mountain. Um, so the more time I spent on Everest and the more I began to think about all of this and just the sheer scale of the thing, like it's it's mad to to think that you know ordinary climbers or even good climbers you know take one step every 60 seconds call it when you get to the top and that's you know on heavily assisted oxygen it's kind of like it's a very difficult place to orchestrate a search and and recovery you know it's not a football pitch and and it's you know uh you know 8,500 meters you know you're 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 in the middle of a death zone and and it's a complicated thing and I, I, I kind of my optimism was slowly getting crushed yeah. kind of out of me as I just realised, you know, that it was going to be less and less likely that we were going to find him. Um, and that was quite painful at the time because I was thinking, you know, that we were really disappointing him and that we were so close to him. He's somewhere here, 
like you know within a few hundred meters and we're gonna we're gonna leave without him and it was actually making me quite upset um that we'd literally you know come all of this way after you know a year and a half and that we were going to turn around without him and i just thought to myself you know this whole process is something that we want and if it's if it's something that you know we could offer somebody else we should certainly explore that option um because we were finding bodies you know we we had we we uncovered several bodies and there are other bodies that are you know on on the track within sight there are bodies in and around camp 4 i was naive to that i i was shocked i didn't realize that was the case until i watched this documentary if you climb everest you will physically have to step over bodies to get to the summit um you know and and i knew that before making the documentary and again, it's one of the reasons that a body recovery for Michael was something I wanted so much. I I wasn't keen on the idea of him being some kind of tourist attraction. Not that they are tourist attractions, no. but, you know, some kind of monuments type thing that there's an Indian climber uh, just past the South Summit called Green Boots. And he's a marker on the mountain. So, like, you know, have you passed Green Boots yet? You know, and it's kind of like, didn't want that for Mike. No. Um, just as I'm sure Green Boots... <laughs> probably doesn't want it for no. you know, himself or, or, or his his family, right? So I began to think, well, I'm sure there are other families um, that are in the exact same position that we're in. And maybe if Nims was willing to take on the risk, there may be a body that we could recover that is not completely off the beaten track, that would be a more straightforward recovery, um, and I began to kind of we this, we we had we had generated a, a, a kind of list of, of known bodies because we wanted to make sure that any bodies that we found we could fully identify and and you know we we just wanted to make sure that we had as much accurate information as we could you know doing all of this um, and sorry so long story short there was a I was talking to to Mingma Tenzing who's just phenomenal like the greatest character zips up and down Everest like a mountain goat, you know, un unreal, this guy. Um, and by the way, just quickly, like nod to the, sh nod to the search and recovery team. On their second search, they went from base camp directly to camp four in a single push. And, wow. And like that is, it's, that would kill us. You know, it doesn't matter how fit we no, are. No, no, no. Like, well, whatever, like you, no chance, see you later, mate. Wow. And you know, and they're, they're just, they make the most amazing time and anyway they were just they were just incredible it felt awesome getting to know them mm. and i spoke to him and i just said look um mike would have been very close to you guys right like sherpas and um and this community and you know you touched on uh praying in the monasteries and you know there's this very strong sense of connection to local people yeah. when you're climbing everest and I thought, you know, initially we we had we had found quite a famous body on on the mountain. I won't name him again, sorry, just because I'm not sure if yeah, we, we should or shouldn't. But and I in my head I was like, well, maybe we'll get in touch with his family and see if you know they would like him to be returned because we found him, right? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm really beating about the bush here, but but there, I, I I suddenly just thought, wouldn't it be great actually to recover a Sherpa body, a body of a you know, Sherpa whose family um, probably aren't in the position to, to do that themselves, right? Financially. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had a chat with Ming Matenzing and, and just said, you know, you don't happen to know any Sherpas who, who have lost their lives. And it was kind of almost an immediate thing. He said um, that he knew of um, a Sherpa who died last year just outside Camp 4, um, that he is fully aware of where the body is. His name is Wang Dorchi. Um, knows the family really well. Body's in plain sight, just outside Camp 4. Died last year, having just summited. Um, so, I, I just thought, well, you know, why look, at, why look any further, right? So, so I kind of said, you know, could, could you... Could you arrange for me to meet his family? Because, you know, we had these nine days before the second search. And obviously in the back of my mind, I was always 
keen that the priority be to to find Mike. You know, we'd come all this way to to find Michael, of course, but I just wanted um, somebody to benefit in some way from the considerable efforts that we had put into this search and recovery mission. And uh, I flew down and met the family, and this is in the film, of course. And, um, you know, Wang Dorchi's mother w was, was um, you know, very very tearful and, and, and couldn't quite understand why we would want to help them in this way. And there was synergy there with the brother as well. Um, he, you were the Ming same age? Mingma was my age and having lost his brother. And the brother had three kids. Um, I have three kids. You know, there was just a lot of... Um, parallels again you know the, the, there's parallels that run all the way through the film both between Mike and me uh, and this family um, despite obviously being a difference you know despite us having obvious differences um, there was a lot of similarity and um, you know I, I spoke to uh, Mingma the brother and just said look we'll, we'll do our best and you know when the second search failed and Nims was happy to take on the risk because, you know, carrying this, this body, anybody off the mountain is risky. But, of course, they had already agreed to recover Mike, you know, if they found Mike. So in the back of my mind, I thought, well, you know, Nims may be very willing just to, to do this for me as part of what we'd agreed. Um, and he was, you know. And, and so they recovered uh, Wang Dorchi uh, instead. And I flew down the valley in a helicopter with him. And that was a that was a strange moment for me because that was the kind of closing of the Everest chapter and literally flying away from Mike. Mike is still up there somewhere. Um and, and you know, I'm 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 with Wang Dorchi and then the film actually I think like it wasn't as blood curdling in the film as it was in real life when we got out of the helicopter. Um Wang Dorchi's daughter who was the same age as me when I lost Mike, another parallel, um, was, I've never heard anything like it. And and it's in the film. Yeah. But I remember watching the film thinking like, Phew, that, that's been, that's kind of been toned down a fair amount on where it was for me in real life. She was like so upset and in a way was... Um, being given the opportunity to 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 grieve her father and see her father's body for the first time, which is something that I never had at her age. Um, and at first, I felt like we, you know, made a mistake doing this because she was so unhappy. Um, because she was just like I, I can't even, like it was. It was it, hard. To it was watch. a really. It was a really difficult moment for me to process um because it felt like i i had caused that pain almost which you know i feel you know obviously i haven't caused the pain but but it's but kind of i just felt oh god like she wouldn't be crying like that if i hadn't just done this for their family but you know the the mother was you know beyond grateful it's a buddhist um in buddhist culture a body can't pass, a soul can't pass to the afterlife until such a time that they've been cremated. Um, and they have a puja ceremony and they, they burn the body and that is the body passing to the afterlife. And I learned this in the monastery on my way to the mountain and thought to myself, it was another reason for wanting to recover a Nepali climber instead of a Western climber because our culture around death is is very different. And I knew that this family wouldn't have um, been able to, like us, you know, mourn and process his death properly because he's stuck on the mountain in his body, you know, to them. He hasn't passed um, to the afterlife. So I thought that it would be a nice thing for them to be able to to do that. And, and that is kind of pretty much how the film concludes, you know, with uh, with us doing our uh, we speak to Mike at the end, albeit just to Cairn in Scotland, so that you know we can kind of go and visit him as such, but no physical body. And and again, there's a kind of parallel between the two, like one puja ceremony, which is kind of funeral esque, and and then 
our family around um, the uh, the cairn, and then the daughter looks very happy. She's mm. she's kind of, and I just feel that you know ultimately, if anybody could have benefited from our time on the mountain, uh, it's great that they did. And uh, I spoke to his brother the other day. Uh, did you? And, yeah, yeah, and he's <laughs> he's kind he's of he's so lovely. Yeah. This guy. Yeah, and he's uh, he was. Um, yeah, he was, you know, very complimentary about um, the help that he received in the film, and you know, we wish him all the best. It's a beautiful thing that you did as a team. I mean, it's wonderful, and you can see everything you've just described—that raw emotion, perhaps that closure that was very needed, especially for his kids. But of course, you're left without that closure. Do you feel you've had some through this process? Yeah, I, I kind of felt, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I don't really know what to make of that word kind of closure. Mm. I, I, I feel I'll never forgive the people for their actions in 1999. I think it was a great shame that that happened. Um, I'm not angry about it anymore. Um, when I look at pictures of Michael now, I smile instead of feeling kind of pain. Um, I know that he's not in plain sight on the mountain and that he is buried and you know, resting. Uh, he's in a very special part of the world, um, incredibly spiritual, full of prayer and hope and great people. So I'm less concerned about him being alone and cold and, you know, uh, face down without us as such. Um, I mean, to be honest, if you were to be buried anywhere, it would be a pretty amazing place, um, minus the visitation. Um, but no, I'm just, I'm just far more at peace with the whole thing. And actually just, I feel like I know him much more and, um, people who are part of our family that never knew him. So new people like my wife's family and my brother's family, um, some of them were at the premiere and they said to me afterwards, you know, I feel like I really know Mike mm. now. And that was literally the whole point. Yeah. Well, it's... It's incredible. It's a beautiful documentary. I'm so happy that you've had this experience and have had all of these feelings and have been able to help other people. It's an amazing thing to watch and really generous of you to share it with everybody and, and put it in this medium because I think it will help a tremendous amount for people who are grieving, who are grieving where there's uncertainty or a factor that is unknown i think it's going to bring a lot of peace and um and hope to people as well it's beautiful well thanks so much and being sat here chatting to you about it is is great and thank you for for having me and and um you know i love what you do and feels uh feels special to me to be here so thank you well thank you spencer thank you cheers